of Management Studies IGNU presents an audio book on the course MMPC 001 Management Functions and Organizational Processes for MBA program. Presenting Block 1 Introduction to Management Unit 2 Management and its Evolution Part 1 Unit 2 Management and its Evolution Let's talk about the objectives of this unit. After studying this unit, you should be able to understand the evolution of management, the foundations of management thought, the different perspectives of management, the philosophy and approaches of management, the various ideas of management thinkers during their time, the principles of scientific management, the contribution of the behavioral science to management and the contingency approach, systems approach, decision theory approach and other approaches to management. Introduction The evolution of management roots back to the contribution of various schools of management thought which emphasize certain philosophies and approaches as best for managing the organizations. They are referred to as approaches or theories and provide various perspectives on management. Let's learn about different perspectives of management. The first is the empirical or classical perspective. The empirical or classical approach to management was proposed in the early part of the 20th century. To some extent, it is accepted and practiced by many managers even today. The exponents of this school of management emphasized the importance of the study of the experiences of successful managers. They claimed that such a study would provide a better understanding of the most effective way of managing an enterprise. At times, they stressed the need for the study and the analysis of cases. However, critics view that management is not like law to be based on precedent. Management is dynamic and the situation in which managers take decision vary considerably to the previous experiences. There are three separate branches of the classical approach that are evident. First is scientific management. Second is administrative theory. And third is bureaucracy. Let's learn about scientific management first. This perspective grew out of a need to improve manufacturing efficiency through more effective utilization of physical and human resources. This was proposed by F. W. Taylor, who is considered as the father of scientific management. He observes that the best management is true science resting upon clearly defined laws, roles and principles as a foundation. He spent a greater part of his life finding solutions to the problem of achieving greater efficiency on the shop floor. Taylor observed that the workers got used to intentionally delay the process of completing the job and complain about the tools and equipment provided to them of a low standard and obsolete. He identified the need to teach the workers that they would not be thrown out of employment if they turn out more work. 
the solution suggested by Taylor was the outcome of his own experience at work, initially at the shop floor and later as a manager. He proposed this at the backdrop of the Industrial Revolution. Employers gave a high degree of priority to efficient working methods. Taylor was passionately interested in the efficiency of working methods. He initially realized that the systematic analysis of work would find a solution to all the problems associated with enhancing the efficiency of the working methods. He also realized that this was the only way to address the apprehensions of workers. Taylor thus consolidated his ideas at the Bethlehem Steel Company and conducted some of the most famous experiments to improve labor productivity. He has published his work in an article called The Principles of Scientific Management in 1911. He was the first person to recognize and emphasize the need for adopting a scientific approach to the task of an enterprise. Now let's talk about elements of scientific management. Scientific management referred to the process of applying scientific principles to management related issues. Scientific management methods call for optimizing the way that tasks were performed and the job simplified so that the workers could be trained to perform specialized sequence of motions in the one best way. After years of various experiments to determine optimal work methods, Taylor proposed the following four principles of management. First is to develop a science for each element of an individual's work. This would mean replacing the role of thumb work methods with methods based on a scientific study of the task. Prior to this, workers used approximation which was derived from their experience. Secondly, scientifically select, train, teach and develop each worker rather than passively leaving them to train themselves. Prior to this, workers chose their own work and trained themselves as they could. Thirdly, heartily cooperate with the workers so as to ensure that work is done in accordance with the principles of science that had been developed. Prior to this, management and workers were in continual conflict. And last, divide work and responsibility almost equally between management and workers. Management would take over all the work for which it is better suited than the workers, which means that the managers would apply the scientific management principles to planning the work and the workers actually perform the task. Prior to this, almost all the work and the greater part of responsibility were left to the workers. These principles were implemented in many factories and the productivity increased three to four times. Henry Ford applied Taylor's principles in his automobile factories and even families began to use these principles in their household task. Learners, now let's talk about Taylor's experiments. Taylor demonstrated the benefits of increased productivity and earnings through an experiment in Bethlehem Steel Works. Prior to scientific management, work was performed by skilled craftsmen who had learned their work in lengthy apprenticeship. They took their own decisions on the way the jobs have to be performed. Scientific management took away much of their autonomy and converted skilled crafts into a series of simplified jobs that could be performed by unskilled workers who could easily be trained for the task. His interest in improving the worker productivity could be seen early in his career where he observed gross efficiencies during his contact with the steel workers. 
learners now let's talk about soldering his work in the steel industry made him observe the phenomenon of workers purposely operating well below their capacity that is soldering he attributed this to many reasons they were the almost universally held belief among workers that if they become more productive fewer of them would be needed thus eliminating some of the job second reason was non incentive wage systems encouraged lower productivity thirdly there were no incentives that were paid as part of the wage and hence all the employees received the same pay irrespective of the volume of work produced by them they believed that the pace with which they did was good enough and with no incentive if the pace of work is done faster that would lead to newer benchmarks thus they were working much below their capacity and lastly workers relied more on the rule of thumb method thus wasting a lot of their effort and not following the scientific methods to carry out their task thus taylor conducted several experiments to determine the best way of performance in each of the task now let's talk about some of those experiments first one was time study to determine the optimal method to perform a job taylor conducted the time and motion studies He used a stopwatch to record the time taken by a worker in the sequence of his movements in the job. His goal was to find out one best way to perform a job. He argued that the most basic task if planned and done scientifically could dramatically increase the productivity rather than the incentive method of motivating workers. The basic premise of the initiative and incentive method was to offer an incentive to the worker for increased productivity but such a method also plays the responsibility of doing it in the best possible way Some examples of his experiments in time and motion studies are number 1 pig iron experiment Taylor argued that if the workers were asked to move 12 and a half tons of pig iron per day and could be induced to move four times of the same per day they would get exhausted and fail to reach the goal according to him if the works manager could conduct an experiment and arrive at a standard time for their rest or work their physical abilities could be used to the optimum the workers could also be segregated based on their ability and levels of performance to do the job number 2 the science of shoveling in another study taylor used the time studies again to determine that the optimal weight that a worker should lift in a shovel was 21 pounds he found out that the density of materials are different and hence the size of the shovel should also be appropriate based on these experiments he found out that workers could be optimally used on the shop floor using scientific methods he gave improvised implements and could record a 3 or 4 fold increase in productivity and workers were rewarded with increased pay and incentives third was brick laying taking clue from taylor the gilbreth's brick laying experiments also proved a significant increase in the number of motions required to lay the bricks they used the motion picture technology to do certain experiments learners now let's talk about contribution of scientific management Taylor was interested in replacing traditional management with scientific management by developing scientific principles through his experiments on people, machines, money and material to see that both the employer and the workers benefited. He argued for optimum use of resources, both human and material, so that the firm 
can eliminate waste. With his time and motion studies, he has eliminated unnecessary movements, discovered the best method of doing a particular job, and developed standards through the analytical approach or practices that he followed. He demonstrated how an average passive worker could perform better if he is given proper instructions and implements to work. The result of all these experiments was latest specialization of activities, proper design of the job, appropriate methods and arriving at an optimum level in terms of time and motion standards. His second contribution was in terms of compensation. It reflected his foresight in improving productivity and reflects the thinking of the current times. His experiments aim at the scientific measurement of the job based on which the wage rates were to be determined. He argued that increased productivity should be compensated and not arbitrarily based on the union demands or management whims and fancies. He suggested the management to focus on creating a surplus and distributing it rather than dividing whatever is produced. He also called for a mental revolution both on the part of the workers and management. Mutual trust and cooperation should be built, according to him, to fully enjoy the benefits of scientific management. Such an approach, he argued, would replace exploitation and advocated one best way to do everything. Scientific management had a lot to contribute to the workers and their beliefs. Through his experiments, he advised the workers to work using scientific principles and methods, stop worrying about how the surplus would be distributed, and cooperate with the management to develop scientific ways or methods discarding the rule of thumb approach. He also called upon them to follow instructions of the management to chalk out the future course of action and get trained in the newer methods of work with conviction. Its contribution has benefited the industry at large with a rational approach, improved working methods, evolution of incentive system and enormous increase in the productivity of workers. The experiments laid the foundation for management techniques like the work study and other techniques. Learners, now let's discuss criticism of scientific management. Scientific management focused on the stakeholders in the process of industrial management. Hence, it was criticized by the employers, workers and leaders. By insisting on one best way of doing a work, scientific management ignored the creativity and innovation of the workers while on the job. In the name of increasing the productivity and improvement in the standard of work, the workers were reduced to a cog in the machine. Analysis of the task in the job led to work getting fragmented with narrow specialization. The result was on the mechanical way of conducting a particular task. The management also emphasized on the design and planning of the job ignoring the worker and his experience and thus making it repetitive and boring. Lastly, the overemphasized practice of the rule of thumb methods made the workers feel insecure in the name of scientific standards given by the management. Learners, that was all about the concept of scientific management. Now let's talk about administrative theory. The French industrialist Henry Fiol was a major contributor to the administrative theory. The other contributors are Mary Parker Follett, Lyndall Irving Terry, Peter Drucker, Harold Coons, etc. Known as the functional or process approach, the administrative theory describes the efforts to define the universal functions that managers perform and the principles that constitute 
good management practice. They emphasized management functions and attempted to generate broad administrative principles that serve as a framework or guidelines for the rationalization of the organizational activities including organizational structures and relationship. They viewed the job as an antecedent to the worker. Fiol argues that the organizations function from the management point of view. He proposed that all managers perform five management functions of planning, organizing, commanding, coordinating and controlling. He also described the practice of management as distinct from accounting, finance, production, distribution and other business functions. His contribution also lies in his observation that management was an activity common to all human undertakings in business, government, in a charity organization and even at home. He also proposed 14 principles of administration which he believed would be applied most often in organizational functioning. Now let's talk about them. First is division of work. Fiol advocated division of work which means that a worker is given only some element of work to take advantage of specialization. Since the worker repeats the same task, the manager corrects him on the task. They acquire an ability and accuracy, thus increasing their output and efficiency. Division of work thus can be applied to all types of work, technical, managerial and at all levels of management. Second is authority and responsibility. Authority provides the right to command to get the work done. It is derived from the position and personal authority is derived from personal factors like intelligence, experience, ethics, etc. of the individual. Responsibility is the accountability of the authority and arises out of the assignment of activity. Third is discipline. According to Fayol, discipline is obedience, energy, mark of respect as shown by the behavior of employees in accordance with the employment contracts and rules. Discipline presupposes self-imposed discipline, which springs from within the individual as an act of spontaneous response to an experienced leader. Command discipline, on the other hand, is derived from a recognized authority to secure compliance and is bound by rules, regulation, culture, etc. Fourth is unity of command. It means that an employee should receive orders from one superior only. If the employee receives multiple commands, he gets confused and cannot carry out any of the orders. In such situations, authority gets undermined, discipline is in danger, order gets disobeyed and stability of the organization gets threatened. Fifth is Unity of direction. This principle is concerned with the functioning of the organization in respect of its grouping of activities. Activities with the same objective in an organization are grouped together and they must have one head and one plan which ensures better coordination among the activities. Sixth is Subordination of individual interest to general interest. Individuals as members of the organization are bound by the organizational interest and in case of conflict between the two, individual interest should not prevail over that of the organization. Seventh is remuneration of personnel. The methods of payment and remuneration should be fair and should give satisfaction to both employer 
and the employee. Various systems of payment of wages are not considered of universal application and none of them can be a perfect method according to Fayol. He also stressed the non-financial incentive system which was not accepted as a matter of significance by the management. Seventh is centralization. Fayol refers to this principle as the extent to which authority is concentrated or dispersed. A delicate balance of centralization of power and distribution of power should be used by the organization. The objective should be to utilize the talent or ability available in the organization so that authority and responsibility are retained by the management. Ninth is scalar chain. The line of authority from the top management to the lowest ranks represents the scalar chain. Communication flows through this chain only. It can be skipped only when it is detrimental to the organization. Fayol suggested gangplank for cross-communication to prevent the scalar chain from preventing action. Tenth is order. Order refers to the arrangement of things and people, meaning that there is a place for everything and everything should be in place. In social order, there should be the right man in the right place. Eleventh is equity. Equity is a combination of justice and kindness. If an organization demonstrates equity in treatment and behavior, the company is admired, liked by everyone and ensures loyalty and devotion from subordinates. Equity also assures cordial relations between the management and the workers, thus leading to organizational health. Twelfth is Stability of tenure. Stability of tenure is reasonable security of jobs. Turnover is both the cause and effect of inefficient management. Fayol considers that it is much better to have an average or mediocre manager than extraordinary managers who move rapidly in and out of the function. Thirteenth is initiative. Initiative within the limits of authority and discipline increases the zeal and energy of the human element. Fayol describes initiative as one of the satisfaction for an intelligent man to experience. Management should encourage their employees to take initiative to turn out the best work with the maximum versatility. Initiative should also be encouraged so that it can be integrated into the planning process in the organization. And 14th is Esprit de Corps. Esprit de Corps denotes team spirit and union is strength. It encourages the spirit and devotion that is required to ensure group harmony. Fayol underscores the need for harmonious relation among the people as it is the best source of strength. Strength, stability, stature and reputation depend on the harmonious relations among the employees. So learners, these were the 14 principles given by Henry Fiol. You were listening to the audio book by the School of Management Studies, IGNU for MBA program. Course code MMPC001 Management Functions and Organizational Processes Course Coordinator Prof. Srilatha School of Management Studies IGNU Voice Over by Harpreet Kaur Edited by Tarannu Jaha Program Assisted by Chakbandu Jana Program produced by Manoj Kumar Singh. This program was brought to you by Electronic Media Production Center of Indira Gandhi National Open University.